We're back at it again. This is the last patron one. So this craziness we're seeing on min-maxing for fun and profit, rest ye assured, is coming to an end. But today, on this episode of min-maxing for fun and profit, none other than the Black Dragon Disciple Kalex X Tex Mex Chex Mex Cacalex. That's what checks. Requests we cover a Path of War build, a Path of War archetype that I've heard of even before I'd read anything about Path of War. The Crimson Countess. So this should be fun. Not edgy and blood-themed at all. Why, Tommy, why would you say that? Go away, Edgelord. Now is not your time. Anyway, if y'all are liking what you're seeing, like, subscribe, ding the bell, requests that way, please. Patronage take you that way, as into the front of a very long line. And today, this episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit is brought to you in part by the man who requested it, none other than Mr. Daniel Barker. Gotta say, man, I think the Carrion Crown team was expecting your diplomacy checks, but y'all can see more about that yourself when you watch session one of Carrion Crown, which has probably gone live, honestly, by the time this comes out. Anyway, here we go. Okay, so it's a simple build request as per all of Daniel Barker. So we're not gonna talk about our feats too hard we're not gonna talk about our maneuvers too hard. We're just gonna dive right into this thing because really this thing that this thing is, is really good without feats or maneuvers. It's a variant of the Harbinger class, a uh, archetype, if you will. In case you haven't played any Path of War and don't know what a Harbinger is, it's got a D8 hit dice, three force bab, good fort and will saves, four plus int skills on, well, quite a bit of skills really. It's got access to Cursed Razor, Riven Hourglass, Scarlet Throne, Shattered Mirror, and Veiled Moon. So by and large, the debuffy or roguey sorts of maneuvers, its initiation modifier, or the modifier that is the most relevant to it, is its intelligence. It basically functions like every other Path of War or whatever maneuver-based class it is you might know. It begins an encounter with the maneuvers unexpended, it expends them when it uses them, usually as a standard action, but there are exceptions. Our Harbinger gets back maneuvers by activating their Dark Claim class feature. That is to say, it's one back whenever you claim a creature. It's a number equal to your intelligence mod, a minimum of two whenever a creature you've claimed is reduced to zero or less HP, or spend a standard action to get one back. Now. As you might be asking, what is Dark Claim? Well, I'll tell you. From Jump, a Harbinger gains the ability to reach out with Sorceress Malice and mark foes as theirs. This takes them a swift action. You gotta be able to see your opponent or blind sense, tremor sense, scent, whatever, them within close range. And this lasts for a number of rounds equal to half your level minimum of one round. The Harbinger can have a max number of creatures claimed equal to their initiation modifier. Again, minimum one and can't claim a creature that is already claimed unless that claim should somehow unclaim. Claimed creatures using the withdraw action, threaten, and the Harbinger automatically knows the position of those claimed creatures. Any opponent the Harbinger cannot see still has total concealment. Harbinger still suffers from normal mischance and denied dex to AC, but that's where I come in. The Crimson Countess alters this ability with Crimson Claim, which states that I deal 1d4 points of untyped damage to each and every creature that I have claimed at the start of each of my turns. This damage ticks up to 2d4 at 6th, 3d4 at 10th, 4d4 at 14th, capping out at 5d4 at 18th for the low, low cost of replacing ill tidings. Go away, Edgelord, why are you being creepy? You will never stop me. I'm about to. Whoops. First off, like, that's really good, especially for my favorite kinds of builds, the dexterity-based marshals, which Path of War really lends itself to so well. The only real glaring weakness for those characters, aside from like encumbrance rules and shadows, is that it takes them just so long to come online with feats and things. Of course, we have to get to fourth level before this starts ticking up, but in some universes that might be fine. You might need to go the really long route to get your agile weapon. By fourth level, if we're tacking on an extra d4 of damage to a claimed creature, 
right? That's just more dice. It's like a pseudo sneak attack that happens conditionally. Oh, also, at first level, the Harbinger gains an insight bonus on attack rolls equal to half their initiation modifier, a minimum of plus one. So 18 intelligence means you're throwing down two more onto your attack rolls, which ain't bad. And at 10th level, it's an insight bonus on damage equal to the whole thing. It's int to damage. Damage stacking on damage stacking on damage is kind of what the Harbinger is all about. Eventually, it gets dodge bonuses to its AC and reflex save, any round in which it moves. Eventually, and by eventually, I mean starting at fourth level, it can initiate a readied strike against an adjacent creature as an immediate action when she reduces an opponent to zero or fewer hit points. So, like maneuver cleave, neato. Eventually, flanking somebody puts a minus two on their saving throws and skill checks. To say nothing of moving at half speed is an immediate action once per counter making creatures claimed by you shaken, which would stack with the flank thing, neato. As a full round action, starting from 17th, you can move up to your speed and initiate a single strike at any point in the movement. Dumb. Strikes as AOOs. Eventually, strikes ignore immunities. It's really good. This is like DPS.class, basically. I really like it. Oh, but it gets better, Tommy. Why, why do you have to do this? Because this class is flavored as evil and bloody and gross. But dude, we chose to use a male character art instead of a female character art for the class named Countess. I have to imagine you can change flavor to fit your world and stuff. Do not speak to me that way. This is a min-maxing video. Do not speak of flavor text, mortal. In any case, sanguine empowerment at second level gives us, in place of dark focus, new toys to play with involving Vitae. Yes, that is how it is pronounced. It is Latin. I know because I just looked it up. It's like burn from our kineticists, friends, except, well, I don't hurt myself to do it. I just hurt you. Will you stop it? Dude, come on. No, you will let me finish. Okay, I'm sorry. I gain one point of Vitae whenever I claim a creature. At the beginning of each of my turns, I gain Vitae points equal to the number of creatures I have claimed. The maximum amount of this I may have stored is equal to my level. My Vitae pool resets to zero after I spend one minute out of combat, so don't be sad if I kill your snake familiar. It's all in the name of... What was the name of this video? Min maxing for fun and... Yes! Min maxing for fun and profit. Indeed. As long as I have one Vitae point, I can deal damage equal to my class level to each claimed creature as a move action. With two points, I get a d6 of HP per creature claimed back in HP. With four Vitae points at sixth level, I can recover a boost or counter as a move action at tenth level if I have six Vitae points. As an immediate action when I would take hit point or ability damage, I choose a creature that I have claimed, and it must succeed at a fortitude save, or it takes the damage instead. That's very good, because I don't like taking damage, but if it succeeds, it will still take half. I have a weird sword evasion ability. Splendid. At 14th level, with 8 Vitae points, as a standard action, each creature I have claimed must fort save, or be teleported to an unoccupied space of my choice within 60 feet of me. I of course can't make them fall, but that would be too easy. Not unlike, you know, a save or die at 20th, and if they pass their save, 13d6 points of damage, and if that kills them, or if they die to the save, I get half my HP back. I can only do it once per encounter, but once is all you need. Are you, are you quite done, creepy boy? Yes, I am finished. Farewell. So I think we're all beginning to see why we're not talking about feats or maneuvers necessarily, because the class is really good in-house. Oh, by the way, I guess now that we've talked to my spoopy friend for a while, it's a good time to point out that a lot of you really liked my goblin voice on the Goblin Bard video, so I've decided I'm gonna roleplay all of the characters on min-maxing for fun and profit, at least in part. If you hate it, if you like it, if you want some more of it, if you want some less of it, let me know in the comments. I've already pinged the disciples, their voice has been heard, so right now we're doing it sometimes. Like when we explain, oh, you again. Yes, yes, me again, we're not done. 
Which is fortunate for you. We haven't got to the fun part. The part where I, beginning at third level, can move up to my speed as a swift action once per encounter. <laughs> you can only see the top half of me. You didn't know I was a centaur. Now I can move even faster. JK, I'm probably a human or something. It's hard to tell. I can do this twice at ninth level. I can do this thrice at 15th level. But at ninth level, I can turn myself and all of my stuff into a pool of blood with a radius of five feet per caster level. I can do this or become a people again as a swift action. When I revert to my natural form, I appear in any space that the pool occupied, but I'm not teleporting. Whilst I am a pool, I can share spaces freely. I don't threaten and can't punch you. I cannot make melee or ranged attacks or do maneuvers. I am immune to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage. I gain a climb speed of 10 feet, and I cannot gain Vitae. But you know what I could do, in theory, is I could gestalt and you may be gestalting in a game that requires me, a powerful, powerful class, or just multi-class into, say, a wizard. Now I'm casting as a pool of blood. Oh, oh, what happened? Was someone killed here? I don't know. Make a will save. Man, I am going to shred my voice so hard doing this, but I do it for you. At 15th level, I turn into a bloody mist. Which does all of the same stuff, except I'm a sphere with a radius equal to that of my blood form. And I gain a fly speed equal to my land speed and opponent's treat spaces occupied by me as difficult terrain. Now that's not as exciting, but go away, dude. Come on, now we're starting to merge voices. I know, it's hard. Be gone. Okay. That's not anywhere near as exciting as some of the other crazy damage stuff that this thing does. And as my alter ego did state, the Vitae pool does feel like a kineticist's burn without having to take non-lethal damage, negative levels, or whatever your archetype says you're doing. A fly speed will always be good, being able to hide in a bunch of empty two liters, I suppose, because even from ninth level, you're taking up a lot of squares of blood. I have to assume this gets you around doors. The blood would, in theory, go under doors. I don't know. It doesn't say. In any case, the climb speed is kind of funny, and then you turn into a people, and while you fall down, it also makes flanking really easy to do because it's a swift action. Spend a swift action on your turn, you're a pile of blood. Next turn, spend a swift action, and you move to a different square. You can set up the flank literally where Ever. And this class is certainly like the most flavorful thing I've ever seen in my whole life. Definitely would play this. As far as your gear goes, follow this card right up here. We'll teach you about the big six. There may be some Path of War items that are better, but we're kind of easing into the third party stuff easy. So like maybe someone actually plays this. As far as the optimized party goes, I, it's hard to say. My gut reaction is switch hitter. No, this is the Punisher because I can turn into a pool of blood and then reappear somewhere else, right where I need to slap someone in the face for not doing what I wanted them to do while I'm waiting for my casters to hold person. And well, I swift action appear right next to you, then spend a full round action to coup de grace. Yes, I know that is pronounced incorrectly. No, you can do nothing about it. <laughs> okay. We're all done with that dude for today. What do you guys think about the Crimson Countess? Have we played it? Would we play it? What kind of shenanigans can you get up to when you're turning into blood and back again? Is is this a Scarlet from Mortal Kombat? I'm, I'm thinking it might be. Fair enough. Anywho, thank you all for your time. Be sure to like, subscribe, ding that bell. Once again, we're going back to Paizo for the next episode of Min Maxing for fun and profit. For a class that people think is really good, but I happen to think is not worth all the type, but I'm going to teach you how to play and play well and play on a goblin, no less. Yeah, the meme continues next week. The Goblin Gunslinger. See you then.